Okay, so I'm going to start recording and lecturing for the um, urinary system. And this is the PowerPoint. I've made a couple of changes, and then I've also inserted the diagram with the uh, structure of a nephron in there for you guys so that you can add to that diagram, that DLCE. So it's been drawn for you. We're going to label it together. You can add some color as we go through the process of your information, and then you want to write an explanation. Um, here's your objectives. We are not going to spend much time on the mechanisms that control urine volume, just because we just do not have time, unfortunately. So first of all, where are your kidneys located? They are located underneath your ribs, and this is why um, in, in amateur boxing, they will have boxers wear the kidney belts to protect the kidneys because there is nothing there protecting the kidneys except for fat, a little bit of fat. If you become really, really thin, your kidneys will actually lose that layer of fat protection. Like for uh, if someone has bulimia or anorexia and their kidneys can slide down inside of your uh, retroperitoneal cavity and they will crimp off the blood supply and you can actually have kidney failure. Uh, let me talk really quickly about this term, retroperitoneal. This means that they're actually behind the peritoneum. And so when you look at a, a side view of the body, oh, that's, that's a really big bind behind. That's, that's not Kim Kardashian. There we go. That's a, a normal woman's behind. And there's her front side. She's very flat. Um, so we have the rib cage here, ribs coming down this way. And you have the abdominal pelvic cavity. So in here we'd have stomach and intestines. So I'm looking at the side view, okay? So this is front. This is the back side, the posterior, okay? The kidneys actually are in a space behind the peritoneum. So you have the peritoneal membrane here the peritoneal cavity, and the kidney set behind that. So when we do our fetal pig autopsy, you will not get to the kidneys until you pull out the entire digestive tract. And then you will see the kidneys behind there. The right kidney is a size of the kidney. The kidney is shaped like that, which there's a bean called the kidney bean that has the same shape as the kidney. And it's about the size of a large bar of soap, okay? About the size of a, a really big, large block of soap, about 12 centimeters by 5 centimeters. Uh, when we look here, this um, transparent structure that sits over, this is liver, okay? And you see the kidneys setting with the... Um, right kidney slightly higher, I'm sorry, the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney. And this is basically the entire structure of the urinary system, the, the gross anatomy. The urinary system, the, the excretory system also includes this lymphatic, I swear am I saying the wrong things, endocrine organ. This is the adrenal gland. In a human, the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. In the fetal pig, they're going to be in a different location. So we have kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. Now, a male's urethra is considerably longer than a female's urethra. And this has a side effect in that women can get, um, have a higher rate of getting urinary tract infections. Because bacteria can make their way up the urethra and then begin growing inside of the bladder. Okay, and this is called um, a UTI, urinary tract infection. If it stays in the bladder, easily treated, a lot of pain, but easily treated. But if it sits in the bladder long enough that the bacterial infection moves up the ureters in the kidneys, then you have a much more severe infection, and it's a case of nephritis.
which is inflammation of the nephron, which is the functional unit inside of the kidney that does the filtration. So why do women get bladder infections so much more easily than men? Well, first of all, a woman's urethra is much shorter. So it doesn't have a very long distance to travel from the bladder out to the outside of the body. And so as a result, a woman does not get much force with the stream of urine. And so any bacteria that are introduced into the urethra, especially during intercourse, don't get flushed out. Whereas a male, because of the length of the urethra being longer, he gets a more forceful stream of urine, which flushes out the urethra. So bladder infections aren't as common in men as they are in women. Okay, this is a view of from the back showing that the right kidney is a little bit lower than the left kidney. This is an x-ray where they've used um, a dye with contrast, which shows up differently on um, an x-ray showing the kidneys, the ureters, you can see running down, and then the bladder down at the bottom. So when we cr cut a cross-section of the kidney, we see the different structures. The renal cortex, which is this outer region here. Okay. And the kidney is wrapped in its own connective tissue called the renal capsule. You've come across the term cortex before when we looked at the brain. The cerebral cortex, does that sound familiar? Okay. Then we have the medulla, which is this middle area here. This is the medulla, so that middle region. And then you vaguely see a pyramidal shaped structure. Those are the renal pyramids leading down into this funnel-shaped region here called the renal papilla. This inner area here is the renal pelvis. So this is the ureter, this is the tube. Okay, it's a tube, and here it's flattened. But this tube, the, the urine is produced up here in the renal pyramids, drains into the renal pelvis, and then eventually makes its way down the ureters. So this is a uh, this is a new diagram on your um, on your lecture that wasn't up there before. Um, so this won't appear in the Google Classroom version. This is only going to be up there if you watch the YouTube video. And this shows um, nice detail and gives you an idea of just how highly vascularized your kidneys are at any given time. 25% of your blood volume is in your kidneys. A quarter of your blood in your body is in your kidneys at any given time. So just how serious do you think injury to a kidney could be? Very serious. Because you run the risk of a person bleeding to death very quickly. So this is why in boxing, for example, you're not allowed to punch in the kidneys because of damage. And if you are um, an athlete and if you've ever gotten hit in the back and, and hurt a kidney, you may have experienced passing blood in your urine, which is kind of scary if you've ever had blood in your urine because it's a sign that there's something really going wrong with the kidney. So um, the kidneys are supplied with a major branch off of the aorta. So the aorta would run down here, and a major, the major artery is the renal artery that branches off. So a quarter of your blood, that's a lot. When we look at the microscopic structure, the, the basic unit, the microscopic unit of a kidney is called the nephron. And there are one million, over one million 
okay, over 1 million nephrons per kidney. And these nephrons are the individual filtration units. Sorry for my writing. Okay, so you have one million nephrons, over a million nephrons in each kidney. And it all begins at this structure here called the renal corpuscle, which I've shown you a picture of here. This is the renal corpuscle. So right now, you would be maybe adding to your outline, or you have a coloring page of the kidneys. You have a coloring page for the whole system. You could be adding on the notes onto the coloring diagram that you have because there's lots of blank space on that diagram. So you have a diagram of the entire system, and then you also have a diagram of a nephron. And we're going to look at the diagram of the nephron when we start talking about the um, uh, your formation of urine. So when we take a cross section of a kidney, and here we just took this little square here and enlarged it, you see this area out here is the renal cortex, and this region here is the renal medulla. And this loop structure here, this is actually showing um, a couple of nephrons. There is one nephron here and one nephron here. Now the difference between these nephrons is their placement in the kidney. And because of their placement in the kidney, they can actually filter your blood in different ways. So this nephron here would be called a cortical nephron and this one would be called a medullary nephron. because it extends down into the, or juxtamedullary, because it's next to the medulla. And somewhere in my notes, and it's really not important, but the, the number of nephrons that are, I want to say 85% of them, Gosh, I, I sometimes cannot remember these little numbers, but they're really not. It's Oh, yeah, 85% of the nephrons are, are cortical out along that outer edge, and then 15% are juxtamedullary. So they, the, the, this loop here goes deep into the medulla, and that's significant for the type of filtration that they can, that they can do. So we're going to look now more specifically at the structure of the nephron and how um, urine is actually formed. So when we look here, these are so a cortical nephron and a juxtamedullary nephron. And you see that the nephron on the left has a tubule, but it all starts out with a blood vessel. A blood vessel brings blood in, supplies this cluster of capillaries inside the nephron, and then this filtration process starts and continues on, and it all dumps into this collecting duct. This nephron here does its filtration process, makes urine, and dumps into the same collecting ducts. All of the collecting ducts then will feed into the renal pelvis, which then goes to the ureter, which leads to the bladder. When the bladder becomes full, it stretches, and there are stretch receptors in the bladder, and that's how you get the signal that it's time to urinate. Does anybody remember, and those of you listening at home, do you remember the type of tissue that is specifically inside of the bladder? 
that it's it's unique to the bladder and it's the one that can stretch. It's an epithelial tissue. And it's transitional. Because it can transition from, from being really slack and when it looks like cuboidal to being stretched out and it looks like stratified squamous, transitional. So I like to bring that up because that was one of the first things that we studied in here and it was so hard for you guys, but you made it through. Okay. This is a labeled nephron, but I think we're going to get more out of it if we label our nephron together. So, find your diagram. And if you have more than one color, it might make it a little bit nicer for us doing our drawing. First of all, I want to start off with, um, we're not going to go in numerical order. We're going to label these and kind of... I. First, try to follow the, the movement of blood around. So blood is going to come in after the blood is moved into the glomerulus. It's leaving the glomerulus and heading back out. And you can see how this is all as it's moving along. And it'll gradually become... deoxygenated as we move along until it's completely tapped out of its oxygen supply. And you see it goes into this other one. And then it becomes a vein. And I'm not going to color in all of the blood vessels here. So this capillary bed, remember, it's only at the capillary beds where we get gas exchange because this is living tissue. So it still needs nutrients. It still needs oxygen. It still needs to be able to get rid of its carbon dioxide. And so at this level here, these are capillaries. But they're not just any capillaries. They're capillaries that go around this tubule. So we call them peritubular. Peri around. So it's the capillaries that go around the tubes. Peritubular capillaries. So all of these capillaries here that are going, all the capillaries that are going around the tubule, and I'm going to go ahead and color the tubule in yellow so that you can um, very easily see it. I'm highlighting over the capillary here. Not the I'm highlighting over the tubule. So the black line that's going around the tubule, those are the peritubular capillaries. And so you're having what can happen through the wall of a capillary? Diffusion and osmosis. So you have to have, at that level, you have to have a capillary bed. If you were still thicker, like an arterial, you could not have those processes happening. And those processes are essential for urine formation. Because making urine is the process by which we get things out of the blood that our body wants to get rid of, waste products. After the glomerulus, the blood leaves the glomerulus and then travels this process of becoming, getting smaller and smaller and smaller to become the peritubular capillaries. So if the afferent arterial enters the glomerulus, 
What is the name of the structure that leaves the glomerulus? The efferent arteriole. So bigger than a capillary, but sp smaller than an artery. And it's efferent because it's in terms of as it's leaving the glomerulus. So now we've talked about the circulation, uh, the blood supply to the kidneys. Now, if I told you that, and I, I did a few minutes ago, that 25% of your blood volume at, at any given time is in your kidneys. That's a lot of blood. And you're taking from the aorta, a very, very large blood vessel, and very quickly getting down into, in, a, in not very far distance, okay? A short distance, you're going from the high pressure inside of the aorta to a million plus nephrons with these tiny, tiny capillary beds. What do you think the pressure is like inside of those capillary beds? Think it's high pressure? Because you're going from a high pressure artery. Well, do, fluids do go from high to low, but compared to a capillary bed in your toe, where do you think you have higher pressure? A capillary bed in your kidney or a capillary bed in your toe? Your kidney is a lot higher pressure. Mm -hmm. And so one of the problems with people who have high, pre high blood pressure is kidney problems because your kidneys are already under high, high pressure. Well, if your blood pressure goes even higher, it's, it's, you start to have renal failure. So keep that in mind as we start talking about your information because it's going to become important for the first step in your information, which is filtration. Okay, the first part of the tubule, notice we haven't named any of the tubule. So looking at, um, you know what, I labeled the wrong thing. I see number eight. You guys got to correct this on your paper. Uh, number eight, I'm sorry. It, had, it was not clear. Number eight is really, when I marked over my, my diagram, it didn't show it. Number eight is referring to the stuff in this box. Number one, number one is the efferent, sorry, arterial. Sorry for those of you watching at home, I did make a mistake. Number eight is referring to the entire apparatus, which is the, the cup in yellow, and the glomerulus. The cup in yellow, okay, the cup in yellow is called Bowman's capsule. And the Bowman's capsule plus the glomerulus together is ref renal corpuscle. So, so number, three, capsule? number three is Bowman's capsule. Okay, number five, we're following our tube down. And notice it's really twisty and turny. Do you remember on the brain where you had all those little twists and turns and squiggles? Does anybody remember what those were called? Convolutions. So these are convoluted tubules, and they're close to the renal corpuscle, so we call them proximal convoluted 
tubules. Proximal because it's close to what? It's close to the renal corpuscle. Convoluted because it's not straight. It's got all kinds of little twists and turns. And it's a tubule. I'm hopeful that if I, if I break it down like this, you're more likely to remember the parts. So then we come down and we're going down this loop. This whole loop is called the loop of Henley. Okay, the whole loop. So the side that we come down is called the descending loop. And what do you think the other side is called? The ascending loop. And the whole structure collectively is called the loop of Henley. We come down the loop, we go around the corner, we come back up, and then we go through some twists and turns again. What do you think that's going to be called? Is it a tubule? Yes. Is it straight? No. It's got a lot of twists and turns, so we call those convolutions. But now it's not close to the renal corpuscle, corpuscle. It's far away. So it's not proximal. It's what's the opposite of proximal? Distal. So now we call it the distal convoluted tubule. There's a couple of names that you just have to, you know, remember, like the loop of Henley. But um, a lot of this stuff, uh, really, the names make sense. Um, if you think of, like, a, a capsule, a space capsule, the, the people are inside and the capsule is the thing on the outside. Well, Bowman's capsule is, is the, the glove that goes around the, the ball of blood vessels, which is the glomerulus. So I think of it as, um, in baseball terms, the glomerulus is your hand holding the baseball and Bowman's capsule is you, you've got your hand in the mitt. And so the mitt, the baseball glove, baseball mitt is going around, that's Bowman's capsule. And the ball and the, and the arm going in, that's the afferent and efferent arterioles and the glomerulus. The last thing that we have to label on this diagram is all of these different nephrons coming from different parts of, of the renal uh, corp uh, cortex feed into the collecting tubule. I'm sure your nephron looks a lot nicer and cleaner than mine does. The last thing that I want you to add onto this are three letters, and um, it will show you where the different processes of urine formation actually take place. So I'm going to do them in a, a brighter color here. And... Right. So there are three steps for urine formation, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. The first part, filtration, happens here. Okay, filtration occurs in, 
at the, the renal corpuscle. Are you writing? Yeah, I just put an F there. Is it too hard to see? Yeah, it's Better? So filtration occurs there. The first step of your information happens at the renal corpuscle. The second step of your information happens along the um, proximal convoluted tubule, and that's reabsorption. And then the third major part of your information is secretion, and that happens at the distal convoluted tubule. And we're going to talk more about those three steps. But I wanted you to get that on that diagram. Because as soon as we go to the next slide, this will, this, this will, will go away. S, for secretion. Okay, so the three steps, and you can write them down here on the bottom. Filtration. Followed by reabsorption. And then secretion. Those are the three steps in your information filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. The nice part about this is that at home, when you're watching, you can just stop me. Unlike if you have to go to the bathroom during class time, I keep talking while you're gone. Or if you just want to write down what I'm writing down and you don't have to listen to my annoying voice, you can just mute me, which I'm sure some of you wish you could do during class. <laughs> don't laugh too hard, Rachel. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm gonna, the writing's going to go away so we can go on in the slides. So this next couple of slides um, is just a description of the anatomical structure, so we'll go through these quickly because I want to get to um, the formation of urine. So these are all of the things that the kidneys um, are responsible for. Filtering the blood, excreting and removing toxins and nitro nitrogenous waste. The nitrogenous waste that we're talking about are urea and uric acid. And that's where urine um, gets its name. In fact, when um, the doctor that was studying urine, he was actually trying to come up with, with it, what they thought was the elixir of life. And so he collected urine, buckets and buckets and buckets of urine from soldiers. And he boiled it down, and which what he was really doing was boiling off any of the water. And he was left with this... Um, slimy liquid and he saw that it had some unique properties and he actually acted okay I guess my video was paused and I did not know it um, so hopefully I did not miss too much um, but we were talking about the rugae on the inside of the bladder which allows the bladder to expand and then you have a um, Sphincter muscle, which is under voluntary control, so it's made out of skeletal muscle, and that's how you learn to, that's what you learn to control when you're getting potty trained to decide whether or not you're going to urinate or micturate, which is the fancy term. In the males, remember, you have the prostate gland that goes around the urethra, and that's why an enlarged prostate, men will experience problems um, urinating. Urethra, urethra, micturation. Oh, I was right. See, two, two sphincters, voluntary and involuntary. So just like when, when you have to go to the bathroom, um, when you have to defecate, the involuntary sphincter relaxes, and that gives you the urge that you have to urinate, and then you still hold it. But not forever. Sometimes you just can't go as so in order to urinate, you have to relax those muscles. And that's one of the hardest things, as I remember from potty training my kids, is getting them to relax and, and let the urine come out. After you've gotten used to holding it, holding it, holding it for so long, 
sometimes your body, you have to consciously say, okay, I gotta let that muscle relax. Now, these are also the muscles that cause the pain when um, you have a bladder infection because you get these waves of contraction down in the urethra and it's really painful. Okay, not gonna get too much into this. Um, cystitis, bladder infection, overactive bladder. Um, Got to go to the bathroom all the time. Happens a lot of times as you get older. And I think we're at the end of the PowerPoint. So hopefully I didn't um, cut out too much of the presentation. I'll go back and check, and if it's too much is missing, I'll add something. Okay, thank you.